Okay, so uh, welcome. Uh, so this is the uh, event of the Macroeconomic Junior Research Prize, which uh, we give every year to um, essentially a paper which has to be um, uh, written by uh, uh, young uh, uh, young researchers, uh, no, not too far behind their PhD and has to be relevant to the topic of, um, uh, of the chair, which is a macroeconomic risk. Uh, and so maybe uh, you want to say a few words, uh, Philippe, uh, before I present. Yes, uh, very, very few, because, because we are very excited to hear from Mathieu Tachot du Mouchel, his, his presentation, just, just you were, Effectively, SCON is supporting uh, with with great benefit uh, Paris School of Economics and uh, and the share on macroeconomic uh, risk, which is very important because if you consider uh, the, the account and the balance sheet of, of a company such as SCON, uh, the main driver of the of the account and, and the balance sheets remain the macroeconomic, and therefore macroeconomic risks are uh, determinant. And uh, we are also very proud of this prize because the, 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 the prize has always been awarded to, to research, to top international researchers. And uh, it helps us to maintain the contact with a research which is not a mature research, but a research which he, which is underway. That is in the way of uh, finding uh, new results. And this time, uh, thank you so much, Mathieu, because you you have done a work and uh, on herding uh, by rational uh, agents and how this herding is linked to the endogenous boom bust uh, sink cycle, especially following the adoption of, of new technology and idea also, which uh, uh, formerly had uh, Schumpeter. And, and therefore, for us, is, is a very interesting point linked to the discussion because be, be before we began. And therefore, uh, I uh, allow me to, uh, to give you the floor, uh, Mathieu, without uh, adding more words uh, to what I have to say and how much we are happy to, to listen to you. Okay, th thank you very much, Philippe. You actually said what I had planned to say uh, right now, so... Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you were. <laughs> so, so indeed, we are uh, in this chair, just we are very proud to have Edouard and Mathieu who are, uh, I mean, uh, very promising, uh, you know, uh, more than promising already, you know, uh, well-known, uh, and established uh, young, uh, young researchers. And they have written this paper, which is particularly relevant for our chair. And in particular, uh, what's interesting about it is that it's about the, the medium term risks, um, the medium term macro risks of the economy. And, um, there are not that many papers who, uh, who tackle this um, important Schumpeterian idea of uh, boom bust cycles and of the long waves, the most uh, of business cycle work, which is uh, more short term, uses linear models. So you have shocks and the impulse response to a shock, well, there is a, re a return, there is a return uh, to the mean. And here um, you are going to show us that, you know, uh, quite often or typically a boom uh, is followed uh, by, a, by a bust uh, because it's associated with wrong expectations about the value of a new technology that is um, that has been introduced and i should say that uh, one of the reasons you know connecting to what we said at the beginning one of the reasons why this research has not been as uh, uh, popular and uh, dense as the standard uh, say dsg uh, uh, macro research is precisely this idea of um, of probability distributions because schumpeterian cycles happen when there is a major innovation being introduced to the economy and uh, by almost you know by definition this is uh, uh, such events are not prone to um, uh, 
uh, to a probability uh, distribution. So uh, people have uh, been uh, looking you know, uh, under the, the, the lamppost, looking for their keys under the lamppost by focusing on, uh, on, uh, on business cycles. But uh, presumably, the kind of events that are being studied in, uh, in your paper uh, are probably more, uh, more significant and more important than uh, regular uh, business cycle fluctuations, uh, such as those that were uh, uh, studied during uh, the period that was called the, the Great Moderation. So we are very uh, happy to, uh, to have selected you um, uh, for, uh, for this prize. Uh, and we do believe that it's uh, highly relevant uh, for the chair, even though uh, the people of the score internal models not find it very useful to put numbers in their matrices, but uh, uh, we hope to convert them to uh, you know, important uh, uh, economic thinking. And, um, uh, and that's an excellent uh, paper for this uh, purpose. So uh, I give you the, the floor and I let Axel doing, uh, uh, say a few words and, uh, and uh, moderate uh, or chair your intervention. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I will just say that you can share your screen and go ahead. Um, we are going to allow for questions during the during the seminar, during the presentation. So and for Q and A at the end. Thanks. And good looking. Okay. Can you all see my slides? Yes. You can see. Perfect. So thank you for the wonderful introduction and for uh, awarding the the prize to our paper. We're very grateful and and honored by the award. So let me tell you um, uh, about the paper itself. So the motivation for this paper, so uh, Gilles already uh, talked about it a little bit, uh, but it's simply that we observe that many historical recession can be described as we would call, you know, bu bubble-like boom-bust cycles, right? And what we mean by that is that there's, in general, the first phase to the boom that is triggered by you know, the, the arrival of a new technology. And then we see a lot of optimism, a lot of investment in that new technology. And that lasts for, for a while. Uh, and then it comes to a stop, right? So it is followed by a sharp contraction in macro aggregates, unemployment rises, GDP fall with consumption investment, and we have uh, a recession, right? So we think that a good example to capture what we mean by these, these boom bust cycle is the, the information technology led boom of the late 1990s, right? So we, the internet is a relatively new, relatively new technology. Um, people are very excited about it. We see massive investment in you know, fiber optics network, routers. There's uh, you know, companies like pets.com that have essentially no revenue, but are trading at, at huge valuation on the stock market. And that lasted for a while. And then as we know, uh, the whole thing collapsed, right? The NASDAQ, crash, the US economy entered a recession, uh, and, 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 and that's it, right? So that's the type of event that, that we have in mind. Um, and to explain the, the, this type of behavior, this type of cycle, one story, one prominent story in economics is that expectations are playing an important role, right? So that's an idea that goes back at least to Pigou in his book in, in 1927. Uh, and the story is just that, you know, during the boom phase, expectations are very lofty. People are extremely optimistic about the new technology and, and where things are going. And at some point, you know, this optimism sort of goes away and people turn pessimistic and, and the, the, the crash follows, right? Um, so we're, we're going to place ourselves in, 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 that, in that literature. Uh, where we are going to differentiate ourselves is that the bulk of the literature in, in uh, economics about business cycle and expectation, think of these expectations as essentially exogenous, right? So there's some stochastic process in the background that you know, makes agents optimistic initially, and that creates the boom. And then there's some stochastic event that uh, makes them pessimistic and the crash follows. Right, um, but we think expectations are more interesting objects th than that. That they are endogenous and they have sort of a life of their own. Right, so they depend on maybe interactions with the rest of the economy, and maybe they have an internal dynamics th uh, th that that leads to their to their evolution. Right, and if we want to answer questions like why do people become optimistic in the first place, or how can we explain 
the, the, the change in beliefs from optimistic to pessimistic, we need to have a bit of a richer uh, understanding of these expectations and, and, and what's driving them, okay? And we're gonna take a step in that direction in this paper. And in particular, we're gonna think that an important driver of expectation is just the observation of others, right? And what we have in mind here is if you think of a firm that has some, you know, there's a new technology out there and you have a firm that needs to decide whether to invest in that new technology or not. Well, one important source of information we think is that it's just the observation of what other firms in the economy are doing. Right? So if we're wondering, should we invest in, in that technology and everybody else is investing in that technology at the same time, well, it's very natural to think, well, these other firms have some information about what that technology uh, is going to be you know, uh, worth. And if they're all investing, they probably have optimistic information. So maybe we should follow as well and do the investment. Right? So it's this story that you know, some people uh, you know, mentioned investment begets investment, right? Investment leads to more investment and it leads to, to this herding mechanism through which, you know, agents tend to neglect their, their own information to follow the herd, okay? So that's the, the type of story we're going to investigate in, in this paper. And uh, to be a bit more concrete about what we do, so we are going to embed a rational herding model into an other, otherwise standard business cycle framework, okay? Um, so the, the key mechanism is that agent will learn about the, the state of the world by observing the investment behavior of others. Okay, so it's this notion of social learning that I have mentioned. And what we'll find is that through this, this, this channel, people will be able to, or will, will sometimes collectively fool themselves into thinking that they're in a boom uh, until they realize that they, they made a mistake, their expectations were wrong, and that's going to lead to the bust, essentially. And to be even more specific, we're going to think about these boom-bust cycles uh, as what we call false positives, right? So let me tell you what we mean by this. So we're, we're going to think that there's a new technology that arrives. So think about, about the internet in the 1990s. And this new technology has uncertain quality, right? We're not sure if the internet is going to be this fantastic new you know, technology, or it's going to be just OK, or maybe it's just going to be a bad thing, right? There's a lot of uncertainty about its true nature. And agents in our model, you can think of them as firm, have some amount of private information about the value of the internet, right? They do market studies, they talk to experts and engineers and they form uh, their, their own opinion. And what will be important is that they will also observe the investment decisions of others, right? And as I've mentioned, there is information contained in these decisions, right? By observing the behavior of others, we can learn something about the true value of, of, the, of the new technology. And what will be important in our context is that we'll assume that this, these private signals that agents receive can be affected by what we call a common noise. So basically, we will assume that agents receive private signals, but these private signals can be correlated, right? Because you know we all read the same newspaper, we all read the same market studies, we talk to the same government official. So we'll think that the distribution of our, our private signals can be shifted either left or right through the, this common noise term, okay? And that's gonna be important for us. And the reason why it's gonna be important is that it's going to make learning about the true state of the world a little bit more complicated, right? And what we, 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 we have in mind here is that suppose that you're a firm and that you observe a, a large amount of investment in the new technology, right? And you're trying to figure out what does that mean in terms of the value of the technology? Well, it can mean two things, right? First of all, it can be that the technology is good, right? The internet is fantastic. We all got very good private information and that's why we're investing a lot. And that's fine, that's consistent with, with, with the observation. The second story is that actually the internet is not that great, right? It's not, it's a bad technology or not as good as, as we would have hoped otherwise, but this common noise signal uh, has shifted all our private signals to be more optimistic. And as a result, agents in the economy are on average more optimistic than, than, than otherwise, and they invest a lot, okay? And telling apart these, these two stories is gonna be uh, complicated. It's gonna be at the heart of these boom bust cycles that will generate, okay? So let me tell you a little bit how these boom bust cycles are going to arise, okay? So we'll think of this false positive situation uh, happening. So there's a new technology and uh, we have an unusually large realization of the common. So the technology is not that great, but our private signals are very optimistic. 
And this might send the economy on this self-confirming boom that, that, that I've mentioned. Okay, so here's how this works, right? So all agents in the economy have uh, pretty optimistic signals about the, the state of the world and they invest a lot, right? They think the internet is gonna be great and they wanna take part in the, the wealth that it's gonna generate. So they do the investment. And then they observe that everybody is investing a lot in the economy, right? And you know, this is consistent with the fact that the technology is actually great, right? So they're gonna increase the probability that they put in their beliefs on the technology being good, right? So they're gonna become more optimistic about the true state of the world. As a result, they are going to invest more in the next period. And then they're gonna become more optimistic again, invest more and more optimistic, et cetera, to that herding process that we, we've talked about, right? And investment is gonna to lead to more investment. And that's gonna go on for a while. And that's the growth phase, <clears throat> sorry, of, of our boom bust cycle, okay? But what's important is that in our model, agents are fully rational, right? We don't have any behavioral biases or anything like that. They use all the information that they have as, as, as in, in the, the optimal way. And information keeps arriving, right? We keep learning about the true state of the world. And that means that at some point, the most pessimistic agent will stop investing. And when this happens, we're, we're gonna figure out that uh, high beliefs are no longer confirmed by the data that we observe. There's gonna be a sharp reversal and, and then a collapse, right? So that's gonna be the endogenous, you know, bursting of, of, of the boom that will happen uh, after a little while. Okay, so I'll, I'll walk you through the mechanism in, in, in more detail just briefly to, to give you a preview. So first of all, we're going to construct a, a very simple model with only the ingredients that are needed to, to highlight the mechanism. So that's what I'll spend the bulk of, of the time today. And I'll show that this model can produce these endogenous boom bust cycles to the, this herding process that, that I've described. We'll talk about how the theory has predictions on, on these boom bust cycles uh, over the business cycle. So we can answer questions like when and why do they arise, under what conditions, how frequently should we expect these events to make a bit more assumption on, on, on the structure of the model. We can think about when and why the, these boom bust cycles are gonna burst without any exogenous shock, right? It's a natural uh, outcome of the forces in the model without any random event to uh, undo the boom. So we'll be able to talk about that. One thing that we cover in the paper, but I, I won't have a lot of time to talk about it today, is that because the whole cycle is endogenous, the impact of policy intervention can be uh, quite powerful, right? And, and in particular, we talk in the paper about changes in, in taxes and things like that can affect the duration of the boom, its amplitude, uh, the, the timing of the bust, and, and things like that. So I'm going to refer you to the paper if you are interested, but that's something that we explore. Finally, we, we quantify this mechanism by embedding that, that herding mechanism into a more standard business cycle framework. And we find that it can generate realistic, sizable boom bust cycles. Um, and and you know, we can have uh, boom bust cycles that go above and below the trend if we look at you know, the long run GDP trend. Okay, so I, I don't think I have a lot of time to cover this. I'm hoping to show you a few simulations, but if you're interested, you can uh, look at the paper. Okay, so let me, of course, we're building on, on many papers. Maybe let me skip that just in, in the interest of time. Okay, so the, the plan for the talk is, first of all, I will talk about a simplified learning model. So what we've done is we've, we've uh, embedded only the ingredients that we need to, to generate the type of dynamics that we're interested in, in into a model. So the model is gonna be extremely simple just to make the point we're trying to make. And then we embed that in a more serious quantitative model to have an idea of orders of magnitude and, and the quantitative importance of the mechanics. Okay, so let's start with the simplified model. Okay, so time is discrete, okay, from zero to infinity. And we have a unit continuum of risk neutral agents. They're gonna, they're indexed by J. And here you can think of these agents as firms. I think it's the most sort of natural uh, interpretation of, of what they do. And these agents have, Pretty, only one decision to make every period, right? So there's a, a new technology that, that's arrived and they can decide to invest in the new technology or not. So if they invest, we're gonna write that I J T is equal to one, zero otherwise. Um, and investment is costly. There's a fixed cost C that these firms need to, to pay to uh, do the investment. 
And if firms do invest, they are going to get a return on this investment, which is common across firm. It's given by R here. And you see that this return is the sum of two things. So first of all, so theta is the, the important quantity here. It's our fundamental, it's the true value of the technology, right? So for simplicity, we assume that it takes only two values, either high or low, and it's not time varying or anything, right? So it's drawn once and for all, oh, I lost my laser. It's drawn once and for all, and it's gonna stick around forever after that, right? And, and we're gonna try to learn about that quantity over time. There's also a transitory component. This one is just some noise. It's IID over time. It's there so that we don't learn the, the fundamental perfectly by observing the return on investment. So that's the, the goal of that. Of that. So let me tell you about the information that agents have. So first of all, agents receive at the beginning of time in period zero, a private signal, we're gonna call it SJ. So there's only one private signal per, per firm. You can extend that and we, we do some of that in the paper, but it's not, it's not that important for me. And these private signals are drawn from some distribution here uh, that is indexed by the, the term here, theta plus psi, okay? So theta, is the fundamental, okay? So the fundamental is gonna shift the distribution uh, from which the private signals are drawn. But there's also this psi term here, which is this common noise that I mentioned in, in the introduction, right? So we're gonna draw this term from some CDF here, and it's gonna, it's gonna change the distribution from which the private signals are received, okay? So we think of that as, you know, agents learn from some common sources, maybe the media, government, some think tank, engineers, whatever, right? There might be some common component to their, to their information. So this is a little bit abstract. If you want you know, a more concrete example, which we're, we're gonna use today, suppose that the private signal are just theta plus psi plus some uh, random normally distributed noise at the end. So that's the type of signals that we have in mind. So you see that theta plus psi are gonna shift the distribution of, of private signals. There are two more sources of information that agents have. First of all, they're going to observe R every period, the return on investment. So let me just remind you that R is, you know, it's a signal on the fundamental and there's some noise. So we don't learn perfectly what it is, but there's information in there. And more interestingly, they are gonna observe the investment behavior of other agents in the economy. So here, more explicitly, we're gonna observe the mass of agents who do the investment, right? Remember it's just zero or one. So they're gonna observe how many of these agents do the investment. So the relevant quantity for us is this, right? It's the integral of all the individual decisions, all the zero and one, we're gonna sum that. And again, we're gonna add some noise here, just uh, IID from some distribution. Again, this is just noise so that there's an, there's a, an interesting inference problem, otherwise we're gonna learn very, very quickly. So here, let me emphasize, and I'll make that a bit more clear in a second, that M is this endogenous nonlinear aggregator of private information. And, and to, to see that, think about all these individual decisions are taken by agents who have private information, right? So, you know, they're gonna be affected by the private information. And since, since M depends on these individual decisions, M is also gonna contain that information. And extracted that information is what uh, is, is kind of the interesting inference problem. Okay, so I'll, I'll walk you over that. Uh, in the second. The timing is very simple. In the first period, nature draws the fundamental, the common noise, all the private signals, and these are fixed after that. And in each period, agents decide to invest or not. Production takes place, or the return on investment is realized. Agents observe the return in the mass of investors, and they're going to update their beliefs using base rules. Okay, and, and, and that's it. Okay, so let me walk you through the information sets. Uh, and then I'll tell you how the information and the beliefs vary over time. Okay, so clearly beliefs are heterogeneous because people have private information, right? So there's differences in their beliefs. And it's gonna be useful to think of an outside observer in this economy who doesn't have access to any private signal, but observes all the public signals, right? So the return on investments and the, the mass of investing agents, right? So the information set of that outside observer, we're gonna call it public information, is you know, the first return on investment and mass of investors, and you add that up until the, the, these quantities last period. Okay, and you can write this information set recursively if you want, you just keep adding stuff to it, okay? So we're going to write down the joint um, distribution, right? Probability distribution that these agents have. So that's gonna be lambda here, capital lambda. 
So that's just the probability in period T that we're in the state of the world theta tilde and that the common noise is, is uh, xi tilde. Okay, and of course, this is conditional on their information side. So that's for the outside observer without any private information. So if you want to look at one of the our agents, uh, well, the information set is the public information with their private signals. Okay, and we can use Bayes' law to combine these things and to write down the probability distribution as well. Right, I'm not going to show you the equations. They're a little bit more involved, but it, you can do that easily. Okay, so now the model so far is fairly general, but we don't need all that generality to make our point that of, of the, the boom bust cycle and the herding. So let me simplify as much as we can to just have the ingredients that, that are needed to generate our cycles. So I will suppose that the state of the world, the true state of the world, which is that pair theta and psi can be one of three things, okay? It can be either a bad state. What's a bad state? Well, the fundamental is low. So the internet is just not that good, right? Um, but our, our, the, the common noise is at zero. So our, 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 our private signals are on average on highest, right? They're, they're, right, they're right spot on. Okay, so that's the bad state. There's the good state. This one, the internet is really good, right? The internet is gonna be this fantastic technology. We should invest in it early. And again, our private signals are not gonna be distorted by the common noise, okay? And then there's the false positive state, which will be the interesting one for us. So the internet is not that great, right it's the the fundamental is low but our signals are or private signals are abnormally optimistic right the common noise is positive so we're going to rank you know these quantities in the following way so we're going to get pretty positive information about the internet even though it's not, the internet is not that great okay and this is the state that that is going to be interesting for us okay since there are only three states of the world we just need to keep track of two quantities to uh, you know to capture the beliefs of agents in, in this economy from the, 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 the outside public information point of view so we're going to use pt to denote the probability that we are on the good state of the world and qt to denote the probability that we are in the false positive state of the world so i'll, I'll explain how these quantities are. So you can also figure out the private beliefs if you want using Bayes rules again. So I'm not going to show that to you, but we have these equations. Okay, so finally, we need to figure out under what conditions an agent would invest in this world. That's pretty easy, right? Agent J has some information set. They're going to form expectation based on that information. And then if they expect the return on the investment to be greater than the cost, they're going to do the investment, right? And, and otherwise, they, 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 they won't, okay? So we can show under some condition on the, the, the densities that, that we've written here that the optimal investment decision is a cutoff rule. Okay, so we're going to call it S star. And it's just a number that depends on the public beliefs, right, that are accessible to everybody. And what we have is that agent J will do the investment if their private information, uh, their private signal is above this cutoff. Okay, that again is, is known to everybody and it's going to change over time. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So that's the investment decision for everybody. Okay, so now we need to think about the, the information that these agents receive. And we're going to look at the endogenous signal that, that, that is released through the mass of investors who are doing the investment. Okay, so how many agents are investing at a given point in time? Well, we can look at the cutoff, right? That depends on P and Q. And we can sum all the signals that are to the right of that cutoff, right? So F upper bar like this is just the complementary CDF, right? Just to simplify, just this, we integrate to the right of the cutoff. And then we have some noise again. Okay, so I want to emphasize that by observing M here, we have essentially a signal about theta plus psi. Okay, how can we see that? Well, this is known to everybody, right? There's no mystery about what this is. This is not known, it's the noise. And the other thing that's not known is theta plus xi. Okay, so you see that there's some information about theta plus xi by observing M. It's noisy, of course, but still there's information there. So we're gonna go through that in inference problem to figure out um, what happens. Okay, so let me walk you through the, uh, the inference problem here. So I'm gonna show you basically to start with the distributions of private signals, okay, up here in the three states of the world. So the red curve here, this is the distribution of private signals in the bad state when the technology is bad. 
In green, that's the distribution in the false positive state. And in blue, that's the distribution in the good state. Okay, and let's suppose that this is the, the cutoff today, right? Our, belief, our public beliefs are such that the cutoff is at this point here. So you see that the mass of investors is just the integral of the private distribution, uh, of the private signal distribution to the right of the cutoff, right? So there's gonna be a lot of, of investors if we're actually in the good state. We don't know what state we're in, but if we're in the good state, there's a lot of investment. If we're in the bad state, there's gonna be very little investment, okay? So now let me translate this information on a slightly different figure here. What I'm gonna show here is the, the, the M, the observed M, right? Which remember is, you know, the, this, this uh, you know, mass without noise plus the noise here. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that here. So what do we see here? So uh, basically in blue, you have the realization of M if we are in the good state. Okay, so the mean is gonna be very high. The mean is just the integral here under the curve. And then there's some dispersion added to that from the noise shock, the epsilon shock. Okay, and, and similarly from the, for the false positive state and the bad state. Okay, so what do we get from this? Well, we can learn something here about the inference problem of the agent, right? So suppose you're, you're a firm in this economy and suddenly you observe M here. Right? That's what's revealed. We, we, have, we observe the, this draw of investment uh, in a given period. Well, uh, excuse me. Um, yes. The false positive is in the middle, but doesn't this depend on uh, like psi bar? It's going, yes, absolutely. So I'm going to assume that we can uh, rank these quantities in the following way. So that, that signals in the false positive state are going to be better than in the bad state, but not as good as in the high state, yes. Okay. I get, I have a sort of related question. So if I were to consider like a continuous support for theta, then, so would it still yes. be tractable? Would you have like unique characterization or? So we haven't explored that case in details, but it becomes, an, it becomes a more complicated inference problem. So you're gonna have a joint distribution on the continuous theta and the continuous psi what we would need is, is a restriction on the distribution of these quantities such that more positive M would lead to higher likelihood of high theta and high psi at the same time. But it becomes a bit you of a- You have unique equilibria in that case, if you input attraction then- I'm sorry, can you say that again? You, you would still have unique equilibrium. You could still show uniqueness if you have some more conditions on the joint distribution uh, shocks. Yeah, I don't think it would change the, the, the number of equilibrium. Um, but we, we, we need to do more work to treat the inference problem uh, fully. We, have, we haven't done that. Thanks. Um, yes, so, so if you observe M here, well, you know, this is very likely coming from the bad state of the world, right? We're very likely to be in the bad state of the world. If you observe M here, well, we're very likely to be in the good state of the world, right? So that this is how agents are gonna learn about the state of the world by observing M. So all this exercise we've done with one specific cutoff, SS star, right? But S star is going to change and that's gonna be very important for us. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through how changing S star will affect the learning problem, okay? So here, what we'll do is I'm gonna change S star, right? Here, we're gonna move the, the yellow line and we're gonna look at what's the mass of investors that we should expect to see in, in, uh, in the three states of the world. Okay, so let's start from a very high S star. So that's a situation in which we're fairly pessimistic, right? We've had a lot of public information that's just bad. So all the, the public information pushes us to think that we're in the bad state of the world, essentially. So here, only agents with very high private signals are gonna do the investment. Okay, so what do we see? Well, if we are actually in the good state, there's gonna be some investment, right? It's the blue point here. But if we are in the false positive state or the bad state, there's gonna be essentially no investment, okay? So that's the curves that we're, we're showing here. Now let's make agents a little bit more optimistic, right? Suppose public information was actually pretty good, right? We've had good, good signs before. Now we're gonna see some investment in the good state of the world, maybe a little bit in the false state of the world and still not much in the bad state of the world, okay? And as we become more and more optimistic, you know, these curves are, are moving around until a situation here where we're extremely optimistic, right? In this case, 
I don't care about my private signal, right? We've had so many good news in terms of public information that my, my private signals is sort of irrelevant and I'm just gonna follow everybody else and I'm gonna do the investment regardless of the state of the world. Okay, so regardless of my signal, I'm gonna do the investment. So we're gonna see high investment regardless of the state of the world. Okay, and that's, that's, the, that's, kind of, that's the important thing, right? What I'm uh, uh, trying to show here is that the amount of information that is transmitted depends on, on, on how optimistic or pessimistic the public information is. So let me be a bit more explicit about this, right? So these are the curves about the number of investing agents without the noise, right? I've removed the noise just for simplicity, but now let me add back this epsilon noise that we, we talked about, right? It's just gonna move these curves a bit up and down essentially. So you see that if we're here, right? In, in the situation in which public beliefs are very pessimistic, well, it's very hard to tell apart these curves, right? You're gonna observe something in here, but whether it's the good state or the bad state or the false positive state, nobody knows, right? There's the noise is, is just drowning the, the signals completely here. Okay, same thing here. If we are very optimistic, we're just not gonna learn anything because nobody's following their private signal. Right? They're just doing investment regardless of their private signals. They're hurting in a way to, to follow the other investors. We are going to learn a lot in the middle situation here. When we're not too optimistic, we're not too pessimistic, this is the situation in which my private signal might make me switch between inv investing or not. Right? And that information is going to be transmitted in the mass of investors. Okay? So just to make this point again, when we are in that state here, very pessimistic, or very optimistic, agents tend to herd and just follow the, the public beliefs that are already there. They're going to neglect their private information to just follow what was being done before. Essentially. Okay, so that's what we that's what we get here. Okay, so this is going to be the low information uh, zones, and this is the high information zone in terms of information contained in the in the MC. Okay, so just to sum up a little bit here, why do we think this is interesting? Well. We, we, we're gonna show you that this can generate this asymmetry that we've talked about, right? So it can explain why booms are slow to take off, right? So suppose a boom starts in this zone where we're initially pessimistic about the technology, information is gonna trickle in slowly, right? Even the technology might be good, right? Information is gonna arrive slowly. So that's gonna explain the slow boom that, that, that we, we're, we're gonna get, right? And then crashes can be more sudden when they, they, they're gonna to tend to happen in the, the zone where a lot of information is revealed. And then we can rapidly learn that the technology is bad and we have a crash. I'm gonna show you this simulation in a second. We can get persistence, right? These bubbly situation in which we, we can stay in, in this state of you know, over-optimism by, by everybody because very little information is gonna be transmitted to the, the public signal. So we're gonna stay in that state of, of high uh, optimism for an extended period of time, okay? And um, policy will be able to affect investment decisions of agents in this model. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll see that they're going to be able to affect how much information is, is released to the agent through their uh, effect on investment. Okay, so that's something we explore more in the paper. And what we find is that um, the optimal policy in this world has this flavor of leaning against the wind, basically. So if everybody is super optimistic, you're going to want to try to uh, calm down aggregate investment so that more information is revealed into the, the aggregate scene. Okay. okay, so let me put numbers on things and I'm going to show you an example to, to tell you how this generates these boom bust cycles. Um, yeah, so let me keep things very simple. We'll assume that the high technology has theta h of one, bad technology theta l of 0.5. And the common noise term is just going to be 0.4. Okay. Um, and then the, the private signals are going to be the form that I've mentioned before. So it's the fundamental plus the common noise plus the, the, the normal shock. Okay. And for the priors, we're going to assume that this false positive state is fairly unlikely. Okay. We, we can play with that and, and, and we explore you know, how that number matters in the paper. But for today, Let's just assume that the, the good state is more likely than the false positive state by, by quite some margin, okay? So here's how we are going to generate these boom bust cycles. So first of all, I'm going to look at what happens when we are in the false positive state, 
Okay, agents don't know that, of course, but we'll look at the simulation in that state. So the fundamental is not that good, but the private signals are, are fairly positive because of the confidence. Here, I'm going to plot the measure of investing agent. Okay, and I'm going to plot three things actually. I'm going to plot um, the mass of investing agent in the false positive state of the world, which is what will be observed in reality. But I'm also going to show you what the mass of investing agent would be in the bad state in red and what it would be in the good state. In. So why, why is that important? Because agents are going to compare basically what they observe in the data with what would have happened in different states of the world, right? To figure out what state of the world we're actually in. Okay, so I'm going to show you how that inference problem works. And in the bottom panel, I'm going to show you the public beliefs. Okay, so in blue, this is the likelihood we are in the good state. In green, it's the likelihood we're in the false positive state. And in red, it's the likelihood that we are in the bad state. Okay, so let's, let's go through to the motion here. So the world begins. And the first piece of information that we get is that little black dot here. Okay, so we get a little... So we, we've got pretty good private signals, everybody, and we observe you know, this amount of aggregate investment. And now we're thinking, okay, aggregate investment is here. So what state of the world are we? Well, it's kind of unlikely that this is coming from the bad state of the world, right? If we were really in the bad state of the world, we would have probably have gotten a lower amount of investment, okay? But then, you know, this is consistent with the false positive state, but it's also consistent with the good state, right? They're fairly close to each other. So we could be in both of these states. There's noise around the observation. So we can't really be sure, right? So we're going to increase our likelihood to be in the, in the good state, in the, in the false positive state, but we're going to de decrease the likelihood that we are in the bad state, right? That state is just very unlikely. okay? So we are updating our priors in, in that way, okay? And then we keep going, right? So we're becoming a little bit more optimistic about the likelihood that we're in the good state, right? Because we've seen a, high, a, a lot of investment. So rationally, we infer it's more likely we're in the good state. So as a result of that, investment is going to go up a little bit, right? Investment goes up a little bit, and we're repeating the same thing. Well, that high investment is consistent, you know, with the false positive state, but also with the good state, and not really with the bad state, right? So the likelihood that we're in the bad state keeps going down, and the likelihood that we're in both of these you know, good and false positive state keeps increasing. Okay, and that's going to go, that's going to keep going on for, for a while, right? That's what we call the growth phase of the boom bust cycle, right? We keep be, being more optimistic, right? We keep getting information consistent with the good state, also consistent with the false positive state, and we understand that, that fully, but that pushes us for, for more investment. Okay, so what we see is more investment, more optimism, more investment, more optimism. So it's just hurting. Uh, uh, a type of, of process that we've talked about, okay? But of course, agents keep learning, right? They're fully rational. They take all information that they can get. And it becomes a point here where you see the, the curves start to spread apart, right? Now we're starting to see distinctions between the good state and the false positive state. And now the data is starting to be a little hard to reconcile with the good state, right? It turns out we've had a lot of information consistent with the false positive state, and we're all starting to worry a little bit, right? So what happens in this case? Well, the most pessimistic agents among us, those with the worst private signals, are going to be, you know, the most skeptical about being in the good state, and they're going to start, you know, just stopping investing, right? And when this starts, then, you know, we're, we're going to have the unraveling of the boom, essentially. More information trickles in. Now we're going to be pretty sure that we're actually in the false positive state. The likelihood is going to increase. The likelihood we're in the false positive, in the, sorry, yeah, the likelihood we're in the false positive state keeps going on. The likelihood we're in the good state is going to start falling. We're figuring out the truth. And this is the crash. Okay. And then we're, we're go, investment goes back to essentially zero. Nobody wants to invest in that technology. It's not that great. And the beliefs are going to converge to the truth in the long run with the information that keeps trickling. Okay, so that's the type of boom bust cycle then that the mechanism can, can generate. Okay. Another thing that the model can generate is, is these extended uh, bubble episodes. Okay, so this is one example of what can happen. Another example of what can happen is if there's, there's a lot of optimism initially, investment is going to grow very rapidly, and we're going to uh, jump in that zone here where public beliefs are so optimistic that 
we're not going to learn anything by observing the, the public information, essentially, right? People are going to disregard their private signal. They're just going to follow the herd. And as a result, we, we learn very little, right? So even though we are still in this false positive state, we're going to be in, in this information cascade phase where information is just not coming and we can stay in that sort of bubbly uh, situation for a while. Again, in the end, we're going to learn the truth. Information keeps coming, but it can take a long time before the whole thing uh, essentially unravels. Okay, so this is um, the type, another type of dynamics that the model can generate. Okay, so you might think, you know, this is pretty simplified model. There's just three states of the world. How robust are these things? Is that something we should take seriously? So we explore a lot of, of we explore a lot of, of variation on that model in the paper. So the one that, that we, we find uh, kind of useful is to allow Xi to take a continuum of values, right? Not just zero or, or, or Xi bar, like in this example, but suppose it's drawn from a normal distribution, right? So we've worked out this whole example in the paper, the results survive, you have the same type of dynamics and we can even write a proposition that shows that there is some threshold uh, such that if the draw from Xi is higher than, than that threshold, we are going to get this boom bust episode, right? So in a sense, it's this, this robust feature, right? There's always a set of Xi such that we're going to get this type, this type of feature. The other thing we explore in the paper is the planner's problem, which we think is interesting here because there's an obvious inefficiency, which is simply that agent's investment decision affect how much information is contained into the mass of investor M, right? But agents don't internalize that, of course, right? They only care about their individual uh, uh, return on investment and the planner might want to do things differently. And this is where we explore the impact of taxes or subsidies to investment and things like that. And we find this lean against the wind uh, policies to be, to be efficient, uh, or to increase welfare, at least in, their, in, in this case, right? Uh, so basically, if you are in a state where everybody is investing and everybody is euphoric about the state of the world, the government should put the brakes on a little bit, right? Maybe tax investment so that th there's more variation in investment decision and we can figure out what state of the world we're in and vice versa. If everybody is extremely pessimistic, the government should incentivize investment to, again, have some variation in, in the, um, the massive investors, right? So I'll, I'll refer you to, to the paper if you're interested to, to learn more about this. Okay, so if I counted right, I think I have three minutes left. So this is not going to be enough to walk you through the whole quantitative model, but let me just give you the, the big picture of what we're doing here. So we are embedding that mechanism, that the same, the exact same mechanism we've explored in the simple model into a more quantitative model, right? We just want to know, you know, is this mechanism giving us some, you know, significant action quantitatively? Is that something we should worry about or not? So let me tell you how we're doing that, right? So we're going to we embed the model in essentially a parsimonious new Keynesian DSG model, right? Um, so why, why do we have rigidity? So we're interested in thinking about monetary policy about this, right? There's a literature about should monetary policy push against you know, bubbles or, or periods of exuberance? So we were curious to see what, what, what that would give us. It also, it also helps us to match a bunch of correlations in the data. Um, and what we have in that model is that there's dynamic arrival of new technologies, right? And there's a technology choice. We have entrepreneurs that can either decide to produce using the new technology or using the old technology, right? And uh, there's two types of capital, traditional capital and the new IT capital, the new technology capital that is needed to operate the new technology. So it requires some form of, of investment in that new technology. And we have these nominal rigidities as well, okay? So the mechanism is fairly sim you know, very similar to what we've done, right? Entrepreneurs choose the new versus the old technology. Agents learn from the measure of technology adopters in the model. And, and, um, and yeah, what we have is the boom is, is fueled by a buildup of IT capital. If people get excited about the new technology, they're going to build the capital stock to operate that new technology. And that's going to lead to uh, a positive wealth effect on consumption that's going to drive out output. Uh, instance. So let me just show you the, uh, an example of the type of dynamics that we get. Okay, so we calibrate the model on the dot-com boom-bust episode that I've mentioned in the introduction. And we try to be you know, relatively 
uh, uh, careful with beliefs, right? Beliefs are very important for the model, clearly. So we use the survey of proportional forecaster to discipline the, the beliefs in the model. So very quickly, here you have the mass of entrepreneurs uh, that adapt the new technology. So, so, and we start in period zero with the, um, the new technology arrives. It's a false positive new technology, but agents don't know that, right? And you see that there is a growth phase like this uh, that is followed by, by the collapse here. Okay, here you have the, the public beliefs that we are in the, in the good state. Here you have GDP. Okay, so GDP follows fairly quickly the mass of adopters here. And you see that we fall a little bit below trend uh, after the crash. And the reason for that is, is mostly just because we've accumulated this huge stock of routers and fiber optics, this new capital that is, is not gonna be very useful. And we've neglected the, the more traditional uh, stock of capital. So we have this misallocation of capital that, that is gonna drag output a little bit. So we fall below trend. So consumption, hours, I'll, I'll follow uh, these time series. Okay. I ask a question on the yes, on the calibration sort of. So I guess like this 0.75, I mean the size of C is very important for the dynamics of your boom. Yes. So the higher is going to be, the steeper is going is the boom is going to be, or the bust is going to be. And is it how you calibrate it or? Um, good question. I I've forgotten now, and I can't seem to click. <laughs> Sorry. <on my> Don't <laughs> so push on this, but. I did. Sorry, um, so, but so, the, the so, <laughs> Sorry? so we, we, we matched a few moments of, um, of the, the dot com episode, and, and I think that's how we, we calibrate the XI, but I don't remember exactly how we pin it down. So, so the XI, I mean, this one, I think this is, uh, we just took a XI, you know, this is an impulse response function. So, you know, just- to Oh, right, XI. that's right, yes. The important thing is <laughs> yeah. in the background is how we discipline the distribution of XI. And of course, then it depends on how you want to, you know, the way you want to think about these types of cycle, how often these new technologies come or, you know. On, on that front, I mean, we didn't uh, take a very particular stand. So what we did is, was to choose uh, some, so the distribution of XI that kind of, uh, you know, we explore a whole range of different parameters. Mm -hmm. And what we report is the, 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 the variance of the XI that kind of maximizes the, the probability of these kind of cycles from happening. Because what we were interested in uh, for these simulations is, you know, how far can we push these kind of models? Can they really, ex you know, ex explain reality? Because one one view from this uh, from the herding literature is that these models actually cannot. You know, it's really hard to explain. Uh, you know, the only way you can explain these kind of cycles is if they're very very unlikely to happen. And that's why we wanted to see how far we could push it. Uh, so this calibration, I think, is still doing this kind of approach. Great. Thanks. But it's not easy to uh, really come up with the moment on a, on a... I think this goes back to Gilles' point before, you know, how, you know what is the distribution of these things? And so we didn't yes. want to push too far and to take a strong stand on that. So I'm, I'm out of time. So let me maybe uh, just, just conclude here. So we, we build um, a simplified model of herding and we embed that in a more traditional you know, uh, model of the business cycle. Uh, and what we find is basically that this herd and mechanism can generate these endogenous cycle in which we have a phase of, you know, high optimism followed by a phase of, of, of pessimism with endogenous beliefs that, that evolve on their own. Uh, we have that people can collectively fool themselves for extended periods of time. Um, and uh, yeah, the model, the, the, so Edward talked about that a little bit, the model has predictions about the timing and the frequency of, of such episodes. And that's one point that we, we, we kind of like about the model is that if you simulate the model again and again, the, these boom bust episodes can happen fairly frequently. And, and that's in stark contrast with other models where these models, th these things would be exceedingly rare. So we don't have that problem, right? Uh, so quantitatively, um, we, we, we are able to get these, these uh, fluctuations in GDP consumption investment that you know, have the, the correct cyclicality and are of reasonable magnitudes as well, right? And we have uh, a rational from the model for these leaning against the wind policies. Uh, and they, they can have substantial effects uh, on, on the cycle. So we explore that in the paper. So thank you for, for, for listening to me. If you have any other questions, we're happy to hear them, of course. Let me start with one last question. Sorry. So, in terms of the policy, so uh, you talked about taxes. 
Uh, more generally speaking, is it the case that the government always want to give more information if it can? Or uh, yes, so you don't have like parts where it's better to keep some variants so that you experience more things or this type of. So it's a it's a bit it's a it's a bit more subtle. So we we need to take um, to take a stand on the the welfare criterion that we use, and here we follow a paper by Angeleto Elvig and Pavan, which is basically we have that the government is maximizing the, the utility of agents, but uh, uh, evaluated with each agent's individual beliefs, right? So, th so there's a bit of a complicated normative question here about how to measure welfare. And one thing that can happen with this, this welfare criteria is related to what you're saying is that you, the government has sort of incentives to, um, you know, have everybody stay in that in that bubble in a way because we're very happy in that bubble, right? For good or bad reason. So that's part of, of, of the of the forces that drives policy intervention. We find the other one that's very important when we, we look at the numbers is this leaning against the wind phenomenon, which you 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 clearly value more information, and and that that is a big driver in government policy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm a bit um, 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 I have a question which is uh, you you make a lot out of this social learning, but is it really essential because um, suppose and also is the is the uh, false positive really essential because yeah suppose there is a new technology there are people who have a good signal and people who have a bad signal right? Now, um, people who have a good signal, they are going to invest. Uh, people who have a bad signal, they are not going to invest in negative. So in some sense, wouldn't it be the case that even if the signals are unbiased, you have a boom initially? So you, you, you're going to, I mean, so one thing I can say is if you don't have the social learning component, what's you, it, it just to, I'll, I'll come back to the, the corner at zero in a way. But if you just take the model and remove the social learning, everything is kind of boring, right? Because what you get is when the technology arrive, you start at some point in terms of investment, and then you're gonna monotonically go either to zero or to, to a very high number. And so you have the you have the second part of the curve, right? What's going you don't have the first part of the curve, but so this so this is for instance a true negative. Uh, well, I guess this is not that useful here. But, but what, what you're gonna get is if there's no other sources of information, then the return on investment and your private signal, you're always gonna learn in the, right, in the same direction all the time, right? So you're, you're always gonna become more optimistic if the technology is good or always more pessimistic if the technology is bad. So you're not gonna have a boom bust cycle. You're gonna have, you know, either right. a big- or you have a, Yeah, right. Or you have a boom that lasts, uh, that is instantaneous. Instantaneous. Yeah, you're going to start somewhere in the middle, and then you're going to converge to everybody invest over the long run. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but it's a bit. We, we think of it as you know more of a it's less of an interesting dynamic. If I may add, so um, yeah. it's true what you're saying, Gilles, that you're getting something that looks like just going down the second part of the cycle. You go very quickly to the to, to zero, but you get something very small because what the herding gives you is all the simplification in the first phase that we all become more and more optimistic because we see others uh, also investing. So that gives you all this, which means also that when you have the crash, you fall from much, much higher as well. So you get something that you know, can really give you also a deeper recession. In the other case, well, you have something that is tiny from the beginning and that converges very quickly to zero. So that's why there isn't much- But, but your prediction rests on the assumption that you have at the same time a new technology and a false positive, right? Uh, True. If there was, and no, you could have a symmetrical case with a new technology which is good and a false negative, and in this yeah. case, you would have a bust boom cycle instead of a boom bust cycle, right? That's exactly. I right. was uh, speculating on the possibility of having this phenomena uh, without the, these uh, these uh, bias in the in, in the signal. Uh, right. So it, the idea is a little bit, you know, the the. Winner's curse. You have a new technology, and maybe people are unbiased, but the people who have the most uh, wrong signal, they are going to invest like crazy. Uh, uh. 
So yeah, even it's... though the signals are on, on average unbiased, the people who have the who are the most optimistic are those who matter, uh, and then you might supplement that with people who react as herds uh, on the basis of this of the behavior of of these winners of these winner scars. I'm not sure it would be irrational to hurt that way, though, because, uh, because you know that that they are wrong, right? And they don't, in some sense. But uh, so that effect in the model, if we didn't have any any of this common noise, it would be very quickly cor corrected. When people observe, uh -huh. you know, we 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 would of course expect that there are some people in the economy that have gotten a you know a high private signal and they're investing. So I, you know, that would be correctly anticipated by people. What, uh, what is going to give rise to this uh, long-term uh, you know, boom-bust cycle is that precisely the, the aggregates are also going to be somewhat biased by the presence of this noise. And that's why then it's going to take some time to learn it out. Um, okay, thank so you. So for us, in this model, at least, it's, it's essential. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps there's a way to, to try to capture ID in a different way. Uh, perhaps with granularity, for instance, that's, that's something like this. Mm -hmm. If you have only a finite number of investors, that, that could work without uh, an additional... Yeah, Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, any additional questions? So I think um, uh, we can close this event and I'm gonna thank you again for this very clear and very nice presentation. Um, congratulate you again for the prize. Um, thanks all for joining. Goodbye. Thanks to us to everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again thank for you. The prize thank you very much. The committee. Very, very interesting. Sorry you not know, to have thank many you. questions because of the, the technicalities. technicalities. And uh, I, I very much appreciated your presentation and the article because I think it's very stimulating. Even at this point in time, I have some difficulty imagining how to include it in, in some simulation on, on risk and et cetera. But it's very, very stimulating. Thank you very much. Thanks, and let's ho I hope to see you uh, in the US or during the summer at some point. Thanks a lot. Yes. yes. Bye. Hope to see Bye. you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.